This is lecture 10 in the Western intellectual tradition. In this particular reflection, I'll be looking at Charles Taylor and the dialectic of the Enlightenment. Charles Taylor is probably the most significant public philosopher in Canada in the latter half of the 20th century and certainly the early decades of the 21st century. Taylor's won two major awards as a philosopher worth a million dollars each because of his ongoing reflections on the history of Western intellectual thought, Western political philosophy, and how we came to be where we are today. Taylor is probably the leading thinker in terms of justifying the Enlightenment project, but in a sophisticated, thoughtful, and nuanced way. So to know Taylor is, first of all, to be grounded in a significant Canadian thinker, but also a Canadian thinker who's thought broadly and deeply about the Western intellectual tradition, of which the Enlightenment heritage itself plays a significant role. I might add that in doing 311, Poli Sci 311, we looked at the Western classical tradition, pre-Christian, the world of pre-Socratic Greeks, Plato, Aristotle, and then the broader Christian tradition and how it synthesized the best of that Jewish, Greek, Roman heritage. And out of that came Christendom or Christian civilization itself, which began to break down with the Reformation, Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. Now, Taylor, being Hegelian, and we've touched on Hegel in this course, and we'll be reflecting more on Hegel. Charles Taylor has written two massive books on Hegel, and he is seen as certainly a significant, although not the only, uh, interpreter of Hegel, because Hegel can be interpreted in a right-wing manner, he can be interpreted in a centrist manner, and he can be interpreted in a left-wing manner. Obviously, Karl Marx took Hegel and moved him in an economic left-wing direction. There are many who see Hegel as a significant political philosopher in terms of social democracy, a centrist. And there are people who interpret Hegel's notion of freedom, particularly freedom of the marketplace, in terms of the dialectic of history. So much hinges on how Hegel is interpreted. And as I said, he can be... Um, read in different different ways, but Charles Taylor is a key interpreter of Hegel, and Hegel was probably one of the more significant philosophers of the Enlightenment, not only the German Enlightenment tradition, but the broader Enlightenment heritage itself. Uh, the dilemma of the, of course, the dialectical tradition of which Hegel is a key figure is that history is always somewhat less enlightened. It's a lower level of the dialectic of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And so the past, in that sense, is at a lower level of understanding the nature of liberty or the consciousness of liberty itself. And so the phase and the stage and the evolving, unfolding history of humankind at the level of thought, and for Marx at the level of economics, is at a more enlightened, a more progressive level, and is this progressive level of which the Enlightenment sees itself, hence the past is less significant in terms of wisdom and insight. Now, Taylor buys into this Hegelian tradition, hence, when he deals with the classical past, he's inevitably distorting it to serve his own understanding of history as progress history as a dialectic ever forward into a more insightful, more enlightened, more progressive world view. But he does it in a thoughtful, he does it in an informed, he does it in a nuanced way, and part of that is the dialectic of the enlightenment itself. Not only the dialectic of history, of how history is moving forward in a progressive manner, but the dialectic within the enlightenment heritage itself. And so what I'd like to do is look at three elements of Taylor's thinking within that Enlightenment tradition and why he is a significant thinker in defending the Enlightenment project in the best sense of the word. And this is why Charles Taylor remains and will remain so an important uh, philosopher and political philosopher and then probably one of the most significant 
Canadian philosophers as well. He thought deeply about teaching as he did at McGill in Quebec. He thought significantly about the English-French question in Canada. I won't cover that as much in this lecture, but those who are keen in getting a sense of Taylor's Enlightenment dialectic within the English-French in First Nations tradition itself, that's another path that could be taken in Taylor's thinking. But three areas I want to touch on in Taylor's Enlightenment project. The first is the epistemology. So there are three ways, which I've touched on last week, and Taylor is very good in summing this up. There's the right wing of the Enlightenment, in which rationalism, empiricism, logical thinking, induction, deduction, the mathematical way of bringing uh, clear and distinct ideas, which is uh, objective, they cannot be doubted. And it is this one way of the Enlightenment, a certain understanding of science, a certain understanding of reason. Of course, science can be defined in many ways as can reason. But this has dominated the right wing of the Enlightenment and has brought much good. It also has its blind spots when it becomes an imperialistic way of knowing that colonizes other ways of knowing. And so this way of thinking that feeds into a certain notion today of, say, the new atheists or a certain read of science that rejects other ways of knowing, um, is we're indebted to that through the Enlightenment. And as I mentioned, Taylor is quite willing to acknowledge the good this understanding of reason and science uh, has brought to the West and other parts of the world. But when it becomes an imperial way of knowing and colonizes other ways of knowing, it also conceals important insights. The flip side to the rationalist way of knowing of the Enlightenment, or the dialectic epistemologically, is the romantic way of knowing in which intuition, in which imagination, in which myth, in which feelings uh, are a part of knowing. And the great romantic tradition within Western civilization held high this way of knowing, uh, of, of myth, of intuition, of imagination, of feeling, of desires. Uh, and this way of knowing can reveal much that rationalism conceals. Now, imagination can, if not careful, slip into fantasy, and rational reason could slip into rationalism. But both of these ways of knowing can reveal much good uh, when brought together in the service of opening up ways of understanding the human soul, of society, of politics. And this is the third way in that dialectic of the Enlightenment in terms of epistemology of ways of knowing, which is the humanist way of knowing. And so Hegel, like Taylor, stand within that humanist wing of the Enlightenment that does not priorize either the rationalist way of knowing or the imaginative way of knowing. Knowing both can go askew, both can conceal, both can become imperialistic, which colonize other ways of knowing, but both have goods to contribute when, in fact, they work together to open up um, the larger mysteries of life itself, recognizing there always will be mystery and uh, a part of that, best of that enlightenment dialectic is recognizing the journey ever forward as Taylor ends his Massey lectures from an Italian quote, la lotta continua, the journey goes ever on, or the struggle goes ever on. So that's the first element of the dialectic of the environment, the epistemological one. The second is the whole issue of politics and economics. Again, if you go to the right in Western political economic thought, the market economy, laissez-faire, is seen as the way forward. The invisible hand of Adam Smith will bring a bumper crop, the wealth of nations, a lighter state, a lighter taxes. So where you have uh, people competing in the marketplace, this is a good and will benefit one and all. The critique of that within the Western tradition is that in fact what that creates is immense inequalities economically within society and out of this then you get soft leftist and ex more extreme leftist traditions of statist involvement the state owning the means of production you go further left you have marx in that thinking 
And so the dialectic in terms of political and economics, again, is what is the good in the market economy? What does it deliver in terms of an economic um, boon or profit? But where does it lead to injustice, inequalities? And how can more a social liberal tradition or what we would call the welfare state uh, come as a corrective, but then how does the market economy come as a corrective to too much state in, inter, in involvement? So state and society in this dynamic interchange or dialectic is foundation. Very important to understand that Charles Taylor himself began very much as he was doing his graduate and doctoral studies in England. He was part of the labor movement, part very much of the leftist uh, political tradition. He ran against Pierre Trudeau in the 1960s. Uh, Trudeau at that point, even though leaning in the NDP tradition, didn't feel the NDP would ever become uh, a party which would take power in Ottawa. So Trudeau, even though ha having a great deal of affinity with the NDP, ran liberal, went on, of course, to uh, become the prime minister after Pearson left politics as prime minister, but Charles Taylor ran against Pierre Trudeau as an NDP. So Taylor Taylor begins his political journey, practically speaking, from theory to practice, in fact, running against Trudeau in the 1960s in Quebec. Um, so you can see in his thinking, uh, dialectically, he, he saw very clearly the problems of the right. He moves to the left, but increasingly, as Taylor journeys in his political life of social criticism in which he critiques the liberal soft right tendencies and certainly the conservative party as he understood that. Uh, his social criticism was one, and this is another important dialectic, is that he came to see when you take too strong a position on anything, in this case um, social criticism, it may blind you uh, to the insights of other perspectives. So out of gradually uh, Taylor's own thinking, he, he moves in a direction what we call uh, hermeneutical generosity, in which, yes, the left has its insight, but what may be the insights of the liberals and the right? Uh, so this tension in Taylor, again a dialectic between social criticism and philosophical uh, generosity, which he picks up from Hans Georg Gadamer and uh, Frankfurt School, critical thinking, again, dialectic of the Enlightenment. Now, if you push hermeneutical generosity too far, what you get is just different perspectives. And then what happens is social criticism becomes muted because all there are are perspectives and trying to be sensitive to different insights then leads to, well, I don't take a position on anything. It becomes the Hamlet perspective. But social criticism, which is not in touch with hermeneutical generosity, leads to a dangerous form of ideology uh, in which politics becomes one of confrontation. And each person um, becomes cemented into a position and hence the, the nimbleness or the ability to see the good in other perspectives gets lost. So another dialectic, uh, social criticism and hermeneutical generosity. One more uh, theme, and then I will leave this, is the relationship of the secular to the sacred. Certainly within the right wing, again, of the Enlightenment, the secular position has come to dominate, uh, in which religion and the sacred is the problem. Um, religious wars, the violence that occurs between religious communities. Uh, so a strong secularism, both philosophically and then politically, has come to dominate, also a critique of certain forms of religion, which are theocratic and that still exist in the world. And so the secular wing of the Enlightenment was one, again, which was reductionistic, as of Cyclops-like. It basically marginalized or negated um, the sacred. Now, the flip side of too much sacred without the secular is where you get an imperialism of a certain type of religion in which the secular becomes dominated by a very dogmatic form of religion, which is very, very dangerous. What Taylor does, again in the dialectic of the Enlightenment, uh, is argue that there has to be a tension between the secular and the sacred, and neither have the right to dominate the other. But in fact, it is in this dialogue or dialectic in which the best of both comes together. You have a healthy, you have a vigorous, and you have... Um, 
in increasingly so in involving uh, common good, both within a country and uh, within the larger world. And so in Charles Taylor's understanding of the dialectic of invite enlightenment, you can see both the good of the tensions he's holding together in his thinking epistemologically um, between social criticism and hermeneutical generosity, uh, leftist right-wing politics, secular, sacred. Uh, the key thing to note though in criticizing Taylor, which is important, is that because of his, his Hegelianism, the past is always seen as inferior, it's, symbol, it's somewhat subordinate to where we are today. And this leads to, in many ways, that chronological snobbery. And this is the danger of, when, or memoricide in the long run. So many of us today at a, probably at a cruder level, not at a sophisticated Hegelian Taylor level, um, memoricide dominates. And the underlying um, reason for that is because if history is ever moving forward in a progressive uphill manner, then why learn about the past in any substantive way? Because it's a lower level of understanding and one pushes that argument further than only the present in its complex Hegelian Taylor way is worth knowing as we move dialectically into the future. And so Charles Taylor, a dialectic of the Enlightenment, very important. And as we use his book, his Massey Lectures, The Malaise of Modernity, He'll be looking at significant elements of the modern project and the Malays people have, and he's going to be unpacking in those lectures, which is really an abridged version of his larger book, Sources of the Self, just like he has another large volume, The Secular Age, the difference between narcissistic individualism and authentic individualism. And so again, what you get in Taylor, he's looking at the distortions of a good within the Enlightenment project and trying to get at the genuine notion of meaningful individualism or authentic. Authentic is just a Greek word, authentikos. It comes from um, um, the, the tanning leather, so it's genuine leather. So like a genuine individuality versus uh, shallow or narcissistic individuality. And so as we move into Malaysia modernity, we'll be looking at how the dialectic of Taylor interprets the whole issue of genuine individualism versus its counterfeit and distortion. But to understand that Taylor, in his understanding of the Enlightenment, is deeply Hegelian and the dialectic he lives with offends many who want simple, clear and distinct answers, whereas he argues the answers are in the tension itself.